So thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed today. Um, we're very excited about this um, to talk about um, e-courts and artificial intelligence in Papua New Guinea. Um, first, could you please briefly describe your professional roles for our listeners? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Gibbs Salika, and I'm the Chief Justice of Papua New Guinea. And I'm Alison Holt, and I'm e-judiciary advisor to the Chief Justice. So I'm responsible for running projects that support the development of an e-judiciary. Wonderful, thank you. Um, could you please tell us about the sentencing engine that has been created in Papua New Guinea? Um, and is, yes. this, is this only for research and academic purposes, or is it being uh, used in decision-making as well? Um, so at the moment, Melissa, it's um, just for research and academic purposes. Um, the idea itself um, for a sentencing engine grew out of a WhatsApp group that I hosted called Just Data, which was pulling together friends and colleagues from um, around the world to look at how we better use data in the justice, in law and justice sector. And from that group came the opportunity to work with a group of master's students at Manukau Institute of Technology, Auckland in New Zealand, um, to develop a sentencing engine that would predict the length of sentences based on case and judgment details. And the group supervisors included um, data analytics, law and AI subject matter experts. So it was the perfect combination for us. And that group was set up as part of the Manukau Institute of Technology Industry Project in 2019. And um, at the end of their first year, the group sent me a project report on their progress that showed um, a budget of zero dollars and hours spent as 1,538. So <laughs> um, it was great actually working collaboratively with students. Um, they got something out of it and, and we, we ended up with something out of it as well. The students' first attempt at developing an AI sentencing engine had very low accuracy, but they managed to increase the accuracy by adding an extra stage to the AI engine. We still feel that we could increase the accuracy um, even further by applying some more metadata or informational tags to individual judgments. So we're hoping to involve local Papua New Guinean law students in a research project to identify these metadata tags that can provide the greatest value to the sentencing engine. And of course, the side product of the research project would be that we could use these metadata tags to develop an enhanced search capability over our historical case data. That sounds fantastic. Um, how do you foresee this collaboration with the universities developing moving forward? Since it was so successful, do you think that you'll, that you'll continue working with them on other projects? Um, certainly the, the Auckland Digital students, um, we've got some new projects coming up with them. So having done the um, AI engine itself, we thought it'd be a very useful tool for judges to have a model of how an AI engine works and actually um, be transparent about what happens at every stage and show real words and what happens to those words as they go through the engine. Um, that would be something that would be picked up for training with our um, PNG um, Centre for Judicial Excellence, something we'd, we'd use with our, with our judges, but also a really good um, sanity check on the stages of the AI, AI process. So, but um, the Chief Justice will, will say yeah, something yeah, about yeah, the law yeah, students. Yeah, yeah, the, currently, <laughs> at, this, at this point in time in our development in IT and everything else, I'm not sure uh, the extent of um, of development and understanding of uh, artificial intelligence in our law school here at the University of Papua New Guinea. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't I don't think there is any such project in at the university at this point in time. Uh, uh, so at this at this point in time, it's just ourselves here, the judiciary, and um, the PNG Center for Judicial Excellence. Perhaps later on, from from you know, our experiences here, we might be able to sell the idea to the university students and to the, especially to those who have graduated from the University of Papua New Guinea, but then who are awaiting to to come to the uh, the legal training institute to to be training to be become lawyers. And then we might be able to sell the idea to them to possibly take it up and and uh, allow their students to also. 
to get involved in in understanding the concept of AI. Mm. I, th- I think I think for um, for most people, um, AI is just a black box, mm. and there's a yeah. there's no understanding what happens within an AI system. And I think we're trying mm-hmm. to um, be transparent about the stages in our in the sentencing engine that we've developed, but also develop this model so that we can actually um, educate in AI systems. And we, we see a lot of benefits for that. Yeah. Well. Mm-hmm. Um, c- can I ask you, you mentioned uh, that part of the project is then um, letting judges see how an AI system uh, works. Ha- have you already gone through this process of showing it to judges or is that something in the future? It's, it's something that we're, cu- we're currently yeah, working uh, on with the, with uh, the students. Uh, uh, not as yet, not as yes. yet, not, not as yet here in, in <laughs> Papua, Papua New Guinea. Uh, although we've we've mentioned it uh, in you know very very uh, briefly, uh, I think we are still uh, trying to grapple with the idea of um, of AI as to how we can utilize that tool in the judiciary uh, workforce. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, the Global Judicial Integrity Network has also begun working, um, as you know, on, on how judiciaries can use artificial intelligence um, ethically uh, to help them. And we, we've seen this, um, you know, around the globe that, that um, judiciaries aren't quite sure of how it works. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think it's a fantastic project um, that, that'll be really useful. Yeah, for, um, for us, yeah, for us, yeah, Melissa, we just need to first of all have it um, awareness amongst our our uh, judiciary here, and uh, and discuss amongst ourselves as to how AI uh, might be utilized in in our workplace. How can it can, can we use it, and uh, uh, what are the limits and the limitations in relation to the use of AI technology in our in our area of work. Mm. And, and uh-huh. I think I think in doing that, Melissa, as well, um, we're preparing our own judges for when cyber cases come up yeah. in the courts, yeah. so that they've uh-huh. got a better understanding of the terminology yeah. and the sort of um, things that are happening um, that that actually might might come to us from yeah. um, from a from yeah. a legal sense. Yeah. I've I've got an example of kind of how the AI model works. Um, that that I'll just I'll just go through quickly because I think it just makes it. Um, more more accessible, more more tangible. Mm-hmm. So so the, the having built um, um, a sort of prototype sentencing engine, um, it works on pre-processed case records, and starts by distilling the information held in those records, to ensure that only information that's relevant to decision making is actually used as part of the AI processor. So for example, if we start with the sentence. The quick brown fox jumps over a lazy dog, and we remove the stop words, which is a and uh, a and the. Um, we're left with the words quick brown fox jumps over lazy dog. Um, so one of our pre-processing stages involves removing the stop words, the common words such as sentence and court, mm-hmm. and uncommon words such as fracas, um, from the PNG Judiciary Historical Case Data. And even going through that process with our own historical case data, we removed 43.5% of the words across all our cases. So it just gives an idea that of that there's a number of pre-processing stages that actually sort of um, distill and refine the case material um, down to um, a, a set of word, words that have meaning that are, and then we're ready to train the neural networks, which is the AI bit, which is the mysterious bit. So the model will take through all these different stages with real um, um, case examples so that it, it's obvious to the judges what happens at each stage. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, at the high-level event the network hosted in Doha, we um, had spoken with um, the Judiciary of India, and they mentioned that they're digitizing their their case records, that they're they're making them ready to put into AI programs, and that this this first step of the process is taking them quite a lot of time. Um, so, for this project, can can you mention how many how how many cases did you input, or how much case data did did you end up using? Um, I can't I can't see how much, but uh, we have our historical case data going back. Um, 
years, I think probably yeah. 25 years plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's all available um, for us in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that we can actually pull into the, the students could pull into the AI, AI engine. So we were very fortunate. I think that was um, one of the things that um, gave us a good head start was that we actually had that data available. And we had our cases in digital form with, with yeah. um, our sentencing database, holding our sentences for um, just to test how good the AI engine was. Yeah, that's excellent. So, I, I know I've, having everything digitized makes it much more accessible. Um, yes. I, I wanted to ask, what other AI-related projects has the judiciary begun already? So we've 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 completed the first pass of the sentencing engine, mm -hmm. and we've decided before we go into any more AI projects to actually build the AI model for teaching purposes before we do anything else, mm -hmm. because I think it. I think it's very important that the um, judges have confidence and um, and actually can can see the the value of AI, or they can they they can see it as it is <laughs> before we um, go into other areas. Yeah. Uh, we we feel that at this point in time that that we we could use AI um, as a as a um, case management tool as a case mm -hmm. management tool in in our line of work. Uh, I know at you know the recent uh, conference we were told how much backlog of cases India had, and um, although ours might not be as much as uh, what yeah. India has, we are also we we were thinking okay if we had that then that AI then that AI would help us in uh, in uh, managing our uh, case flow and case uh, management and case disposition. Uh, um, maybe better and may, may assist us to get there mm. in disposing, dis disposing of cases. I know that case management is uh, one of the most commonly um, uh, mentioned applications that we hear of from judiciaries. I think this is um, what, what a lot of judiciaries are doing. Um, you, you mentioned um, that uh, Papua New Guinea is going to kind of offer this as a as a training for judges. Do you kind of foresee that as a as a training program? Um, I know there's a center for Ju judicial excellence in Papua New Guinea. Are you going to offer the training um, through the center, or um, uh, how is that um, how is that going to happen? I will have to sell the idea first to the judges. <laughs> And uh, for, and the judges to to uh, discuss it, and if the judges are agreeable to having a training uh, sessions or training program uh, for for AI, then we will definitely get into into that and um, uh, get those who are in the who have the technical know how uh, to come and help us to run that course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're, you know, approaching it very responsibly, you know, making sure that everyone understands um, how everything works before beginning. H have you considered also creating some kind of guidelines for judges to follow when they're using artificial intelligence applications? Be that will be part of the discussions. That will be part of uh -huh. the discussions uh, in selling the idea and then the judges will come up with the rules, uh, rules as to how to apply that, that uh, mechanism in our line of duty, and uh, I think our uh, judges who are involved in, in uh, rules make rule making, uh, I think I think we can get that committee to to um, to get into the the uh, to get some ideas from the judges as to how we might set up guidelines to allow AI to be introduced into. And first of all, to be used as a training, and then how we should use it in when it, if we were able to yes adopt uh, AI in our workplace. Yeah. I, th I think for now, Melissa, uh, we we're using the European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice, the CEPDJ uh -huh. principles, and they really resonate uh -huh. with us. Mm. Um, the idea of respect and non discrimination, mm -hmm. um, quality and security, transparency, impartiality. And, and the really main thing is the under-user control. We, we mm -hmm. never see um, AI replacing a judge. We see it as being a tool yeah. that, that assists the judge. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and I think the other principles there, I think we can point to other um, areas, areas in the world where they, 
but they've tried AI and in using the AI system they've pulled back um, ancient data that had some sort of discriminatory um, effect or um, sort of but other issues should we say and and I think uh -huh. if we can if, if we use those um, principles as a basis for what we're doing then at least we'll be aware of um, potential um, pitfalls. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. The, the SAPEDG uh, guidelines are, are very comprehensive. I, you, you probably know through the network we're working to create interna more international guidelines um, on the ethical use of AI, and we also had, had looked to those as, as, a, as a good example. But I, I think you're definitely right that, um, that um, AI applications in some jurisdictions have, um, have, have not gone so well and have um, uncovered biases that were perpetuated. So it sounds like you're being very responsible um, in the way that you're moving forward. I, th I think the other part of that is our realisation when, when we're starting thinking about AI projects that go be beyond case management and maybe um, against our sort of our digital bail, but is there going to be an AI piece to that? The, 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 actually, we need a wider range of um, specialist skills actually reviewing what we're doing. So it's not just ethics at, at that stage. Um, we're thinking of the sort of sociology aspect, the psycholo psychology, psychiatry, um, behavioural mm -hmm. scientists, economists, criminologists, yeah. criminal lawyers, correctional services, police. You know, suddenly um, you actually want a big panel of people reviewing mm -hmm. what you're doing just to see um, you, you're changing the way that, that something's done. You want to just make sure that in solving one problem, you're not opening up a whole range of other problems. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, I think, I think that seems wise to take a, a multi-stakeholder approach. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, like I mentioned, for, for agreeing to speak with us, especially uh, with the time difference. No, no problem. No problem. <laughs> no problem, Melissa. Thank you. And for everyone listening, stay tuned for more episodes in the Global Judicial Integrity Network podcast series. Thank you.